Welcome you. We're glad you're here. Um, thank you for putting up with whatever discomforts you've had to because of the uh, number of people, but we're grateful that you're here. I'm guessing that if you have children in your home, uh, the excitement is palpable by this time, right? As the oldest of 11 kids, I can tell you that's the way it was at our house. I wish I could say it was all because of hallelujah, and we were really looking forward to celebrating the Lord's birth. Certainly my folks would have liked it to be that way, and they did everything they could to teach us how important that was, but I think in the early years it was probably more about the gifts we were going to get. And actually it became a little bit about the gifts we were going to give as we got a little older, because as we got jobs and began to work, uh, we had a great time uh, making sure that uh, there were a lot of gifts around that Christmas tree. But we do want to remember what it's all about, right? We try to teach our kids that, and eventually it takes. That's the good thing. Hang in there. It takes eventually. Heard about one little four-year-old girl named Nancy who was all excited about Christmas. She could hardly wait. So her mom went to great pains to try and explain what Christmas is really all about and why their family celebrated Christmas and that it was about the birth of Jesus. So Christmas came and went. Nancy had a wonderful Christmas, got lots of presents, and was very excited about the whole thing. But to show mom that she got it, what the meaning was, after Christmas was over, she said to her mom one day, she said, Mom, Christmas was really great. She said, I really hope Mary and Joseph have another baby. <laughs> she, uh, she still had a little work to do, I guess, with Nancy. But there are a lot of people that I think are a little bit confused about what is Christmas all about. If you watch the, the shows that are on television, the movies that they make, you would swear when you got done that it's all about the spirit of Christmas, which is apparently something about loving other people and showing them that in a special way at this time of year, about peace and joy, at least for a, a little bit of time, getting along with others. The spirit of Christmas that sort of tends to disappear after the last package is opened, or at least probably by the 1st of January. But you know, God's idea of the meaning of Christmas is a little different. It's a lot more profound, certainly more permanent. And because God is so good at pictures, he gives us pictures of the meaning of Christmas. He depicted it long before it ever happened. Many different ways he did this. I want to look at just a couple of those tonight. The first one is found in the 28th chapter of Genesis, where we have the story of a man named Jacob. Some of you will be familiar with this, some of you not. Jacob was a man who lived about 1,900 years before Christ. He was the youngest of twin boys that were born to Isaac and Rebekah. He was kind of a mama's boy as he grew up, and his, his name, which means schemer, was actually kind of representative of what his character was like, because if he was anything, he was a schemer. And at one point in time, he schemed to get the family inheritance and the family blessing that should have belonged to his two-minute two older brother, Esau. He tricked his old and almost blind father to get that blessing. Well, those of you who know the story know how it came out. It didn't quite come out the way Jacob wanted. It didn't turn out so well at all. In fact, Esau was so mad, he wanted to kill his brother, and he set out to do exactly that. So Jacob decided the best thing for him to do was get out of Dodge. And his mom said, why don't you go to where my folks are, where my family lived, which was about 500 miles to the east in what is today modern-day Iraq, you go there and hide out for a while, which Jacob did for the next 20 years and never saw his mother again. You can only imagine what it must have been like for Jacob that first night as he left home, right? I've often wondered how he felt. Being hunted down by his brother who wanted to kill him, going someplace he'd never been, had no idea what he was going to find there, no idea what he would run into. Had nothing uh, that was of comfort for him. In fact, the Bible tells us that he laid his head on a rock that night for a pillow, which doesn't sound very comfortable. 
And maybe that explains what happened next because he had a dream. The Bible describes it this way. Genesis 28 and verse 12, it says, And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord God stood above it. Now, as Jacob continues this dream, God makes some promises to him. But the essence of what God wants to say to him is, listen, Jacob, you've been trying to do things your own way all your life. But this is your opportunity to realize you need me. Where has going your own way gotten you? Out here in the middle of nowhere with a rock for a pillow heading you don't know where? Maybe it's time to give me a chance in your life. Maybe it's time to get your life squared away with me and to follow me. And when you're ready to do that, I'm here. Don't you love God's patience? Don't we all need God's patience? Well, Jacob got the message because the next morning it tells us that Jacob woke from his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place. There is none other, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob was wising up fast, right? He's realizing the truth of what God had told him. He realized that God had been there all the time, and he hadn't recognized him. He hadn't spent any time with him. He hadn't taken time to see the God who was there. And he saw that the ladder that he had seen in his dream was representative of the fact that God was reaching out to him. And God was basically saying by that ladder, look, Jacob, what you were trying to get, get with all of your scheming, with all your finagling, it's here. It's all here for you. But it's all by grace. You can't get this yourself. You can only get it if you'll accept it from me as a gift. What is it really? Well, dear friends, it's, it's, it's a picture of Christmas. You say, really? Well, yes. If we fast forward to the first chapter of John, we find there that the Jesus about whom we celebrate at Christmas time has reached the age of 30, and he's just given up his career as a carpenter, which is what he's been doing up to this time. He's begun a ministry that's going to go on for about the next three years, and he begins to gather some followers. One of the first followers is a man named Philip, and Philip does what we find him doing the few times that we find him in the Bible. He's bringing someone else to Christ, and the someone else that he brings on this first occasion is a man named Nathaniel. And the Bible tells us in John 1, 47, that we have, that, that, Philip tells Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. He's Jesus of Nazareth. Well, Nathanael was skeptical to say the least. He was skeptical, first of all, because who'd ever heard of Jesus? He was skeptical, secondly, because Nazareth was up north. It was kind of the poor part of the country. It was not, everybody would have thought the Messiah was going to come from Jerusalem. So he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That was his opinion. But the Bible goes on and it says, Behold an Israelite, Jesus says to him, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. Apparently, Nathaniel had been hidden from view, and for Jesus to say, I saw you when he'd been hidden from view was a surprise. Nathaniel answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see, now listen to this, you will see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, which was Jesus' favorite title for himself. What in the world is that all about? 
What that's about is Jesus saying basically to Nathaniel, listen, Nathaniel, remember Jacob's dream? Because nobody that had grown up in Israel would not know about Jacob's dream. He said, Nathaniel, you were right in calling me the son of God because that's exactly who I am. And I am also the fulfillment of Jacob's dream. What Jacob saw of heaven coming down to earth, that's me. I'm the ladder that Jacob saw. I am the one who bridges the gap between God and man, the gap that you cannot bridge for yourself. I am here to bridge for you. That's what Jesus was saying to Nathaniel. I am the gate to heaven. Just like Jacob had discovered way back there in Genesis 28. Wow, it's a a pretty dramatic statement, isn't it? Quite a fantastic claim that Jesus is making. But he turns right around and does something similar just a few weeks later. Another picture. A man named Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He comes at night. He was one of the leaders in the land of Palestine, land of Israel. And he comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want anyone to see him. And Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel. In other words, he's saying to him, Nicodemus, I know you. He was the Billy Graham of his day. He was a man who was recognized as being somebody who knew all about the Bible, about the Old Testament. A man that people looked up to as being the one who knew everything. And here he is coming to Jesus by night. And what does he want to know? How can I have the kingdom of God? How is it possible that the religious leader could be asking that question? But he realized that what he had been teaching, just be good. And what Jesus had been teaching, believe in me, were two different things. And so he wanted to find out what Jesus would say. And Jesus, barely, basically, the first thing he said to him is, if, if you want to be born again, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Well, Nicodemus knew that was a problem. How do you... Make yourself be born. I think all of us here tonight recognize I didn't bear myself, right? I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even get a vote whether I get to come or not, right? You just are. And when Jesus says you need to be born again, what can he do about it? Jesus then tells him this later in the chapter. He says, no one has ascended into heaven. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. The Son of Man, Jesus, the one who bridges the gap between heaven and earth. He goes on and he says, how do you get this? He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So what is this about, this serpent in the wilderness thing? Got to go back now to about 1425 B.C. when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. They got out of Egypt and they got into the wilderness before they could go into the promised land, as you remember. And at one point, there were a whole bunch of snakes that came into their camp and they were biting people. They were poisonous and people were dying left and right. So Moses prayed to God and said, what can I do? And God answered this way in Numbers 21. He said, make a fiery serpent out of bronze, we find out later. Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it, shall live. In other words, you've got a poisonous bite. You can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do to get that poison out of your system fast enough to save your life. But I'll tell you what you do. You just looked at this provision that I, God, have made for you, and you will be saved. And Jesus is now saying, that's just a picture of what I'm going to do. I came down from heaven to be lifted up on the cross so that whoever will look to me can be saved from the poisonous bite of sin. Nicodemus had the same problem we all do, right? Though he was a great leader, though he was a wonderful teacher apparently, he was still a sinner. He could not stand before God in his own self. And so God came to him in the person of Jesus. And now Nicodemus is having to realize he has no cure for what ails him. But Jesus does. Jesus is the cure. Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is the only way to the Father. 
He later tells his disciples, as you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. God's provision in the person of his own son. And that, dear friends, that's the meaning of Christmas, is it not? It's God coming down to provide at the cost of his own life the ladder that we need to reach him. The ladder that we cannot build ourselves. You can't be good enough. You can't pay for it. You can't talk your way in. You can only accept what he has done. What we can't do, he has already done. That's the meaning of Christmas. It's the only way for us to have life is to look to him. The Bible said, God said through Isaiah in 45, 22, look unto me all ye ends of the earth and be saved by looking to him. You say, so well, Christmas isn't about being kind to each other. It's not about being nice. Of course it's about those things. But it's about doing that. It's about loving others because he first loved us. That's the motivation. That's the thing that stirs us to have not just the spirit of Christmas at Christmas time, but to have the spirit of Christmas all the time. But we don't want to miss him. It, he comes first. Jacob almost missed him. Don't miss Jesus. He is the gateway to heaven. So now the little boy, his dad was showing him around the farm where he grew up. I've taken my kids back to the farm where I grew up. I don't know that I did exactly what this man did, but he showed him how all the skills that were required to be a farmer, the things you had to know to grow crops and to take care of animals and a lot of things that were going on there. And then they got to the barn and he showed him, he showed him the ladder that lit in the barn that led up to the hayloft on top. And he said, we kept the hay up there to feed the cows. This little boy looked at that for a minute and he thought, Wow, he said to his dad, he said, man, it must have been hard for those cows to climb that ladder. And he's right, would have been, wouldn't it? See, we don't have to climb the ladder. God came, he is the ladder, and he is the way that we can reach God. He is the gateway to heaven that we can get in no other way. I hope you know him as that ladder tonight, and I hope that you have accepted the gift that he's given that's what God's pictures are telling us. What is the meaning of Christmas? It's about salvation and eternal life in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.